Good morning. It's great to see everyone out this morning. I want to welcome everyone, especially those that are visiting. If you are visiting, we'd ask that you take a card from the pew in front of you and fill it out so we can have a record of your attendance. If you haven't done so, please pick up a bulletin. There's more details and announcements that we're trying to uh, highlight in the announcements, but the details are in the bulletin. Please uh, make sure your cell phones are turned off or on vibrate so it doesn't interrupt our time together. I want to remember the missionary work that we are involved with and support with Velopi, uh, Dave, Brian, and Steve. Upcoming events and announcements, uh, CYC is on the 25th to the 27th. I got confused. I've seen Dallas stuff coming up on the Facebook, but uh, Gatlinburg is on the 25th to the 27th. See Buddy for details. Dave uh, told us he's going to start his devotionals back up in a week or so, uh, so we're looking forward to that. Grant County is scheduled to meet at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, but because of the impending weather, they are canceling services uh, today at 4 o'clock. So um, if you have giving or want a giving statement from uh, the church here for last year, see Derek. There is a concealed carry uh, class coming up on the 26th. There's a sign-up sheet. We need probably... 15 people to sign up so we can at least have 10 show up. So uh, that would be very helpful. If you are having interest at all or know someone that does, uh, it'd be great. See Dick with any questions. The 55 plus group meets this Friday. Uh, Brian says bring soups. So um, that's at noon. Those on our second prayer request, when I continue to remember Frank and Judy Chris, Faye had her cataract surgery. She's here and it went well, so that's good news. Both eyes are done and ready and healing. Uh, Wayne Hacker has eye surgery coming up. It's great to see uh, uh, David and Sonny back after being gone for a while with the flu. Betty Kelly's uh, sister, Jean's having a really rough time. Uh, not only does she have COVID, but her kidneys are failing, so I want to remember her in our prayers. Uh, David Pugh's mother, the Carter family's uh, not not feeling well, so they're home. Uh, Wayne Gray is the uh, uh, brother-in-law of uh, someone in Sandy's family. I wrote it down, but I've got it wrong. Had a heart attack and having kidney failure. So I want to remember Wayne Gray in our prayers. Also, the Wiley family uh, that we ha uh, had in the bulletin and announcements. The oldest was able to go home from the hospital. Marty's dad is doing somewhat better. They're treating his uh, COVID. Uh, Dave has surgery scheduled soon coming up. I want to remember him. And Betty also has surgery coming up real soon on the 24th, I think. So I want to remember her in our prayers. Lots of people. So let's go to God in prayer before we start, as we start our service. Father God in heaven, we come before you so thankful for you being our God, for hearing our prayers, for loving us and giving us the hope that we have through your son. We are thankful for this time that we have to meet here as your family, to study your word and to worship you. And we pray that the things we say and do will be pleasing to you and that we will be uplifted and encouraged by our time together. We pray if there's someone here to not, this morning that needs to uh, uh, do something to straighten out their life or uh, be right with you that they would have the humility and courage to do that today. Be with us in everything we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin our worship with, oh, it's loud, with I love my Savior too. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to Him I sing, onward I go. Closely to Him I'll cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He Yeah. 
everything I do. Walking with Him each day, love light the shine. Doing His will always, never repine. Kneeling to Him I pray, Thy will not mine. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior, He loves me too. I seek His favor in everything I do. Happy to serve my friend, lean on His arm. Will never end, nothing alarm. Voices will sweetly blend under his charm. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek his favor in everything I do. Before opening prayer this morning, we'll sing Give Thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for Heavenly Father, we come to your throne this morning giving thanks. And we just pray, Father, that what we do here in our worship today will be pleasing to you. We're so thankful, Father, for this time that we have to come and sing praises unto your name. We're so thankful for Jerry for leading those songs for us. We're thankful, Father, also for Brian, who will Give the message to us a little later on. We just pray, Father, that you bless him and help him remember the things that he has studied. We're so thankful, Father, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. We're so thankful that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And it's through him that we would have a hope hope and a chance to live with you eternally. We're thankful, Father, for the elders here, and we just ask your blessing on them. 
help them help them serve this congregation in a way that is pleasing to you. We're so thankful, Father, also for our deacons. We just ask that you bless them as they do their activities here and help this congregation grow. We're so thankful, Father, for the hope that we have that when our time is done here on earth, that we'll be called home with you in heaven. Help us to be the light that you want us to be. Help us not to be afraid to spread the gospel to others, whether it's in our schools or in our, at our work or wherever we may be. Help us to speak boldly of your son, Jesus. Be with us now, Father, as we go through the rest of this service. Help us to bring praise and glory to your name. And it's through your son that we pray. Amen. It's convenient, I'll ask you to stand as we sing this song before our scripture reading, and then Brian brings us a message this morning. Mm. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden and carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you need never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you are to of constant rest would you prove him true each providential test would you in his service labor always at your best let him have his way with thee his power can make you what you are to be his blood can cleanse your heart and make For him to have his way with thee. Be seated, please. The scripture reading this morning will be coming from Deuteronomy third, uh, 30, verses... Uh, 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them.
Good morning, everyone. Glad that you're here today. And uh, we last week, you may recall that, uh, maybe you don't recall, uh, but my sermon was on having the right kind of heart. Um, I didn't announce last week, but I want to announce today that every, um, Lord willing, every second Sunday of the month, I will be preaching on the subject of the heart. I really believe that the condition of the heart, not talking about the blood pump, of course, but the the Bible heart, which is the mind and our will and the personality, having the right kind of heart is important, pleasing the Lord and going to heaven. So every second Sunday of the month in 2022, I will be talking about the heart with the exception of of the second Sunday in May, which will be Mother's Day. And I will probably talk about something related to Mother's Day, but I will have a sermon on the heart on that month, probably the third Sunday of that month. Thank you all for being here today. It's so great to see all of you and visitors with us. We're glad that you're here as well. You are our honored guests. We want you to be here. We're glad that you could be here with us today. Thank you to all the men, Jerry, for leading us in our singing. Thank you to all of these men, Marty, for leading the prayer a few minutes ago, and Coy for reading Scripture to us, and also John for your welcome a few minutes ago as well. Thank you for your willingness to step up and lead before the church today. Today I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about making decisions in the spirit of the text that Coy read to us a moment ago from Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want to talk about making decisions. But of course, that's a pretty broad topic. So let me be more specific. I want to talk about making good decisions. Good decisions honor the Lord. Good decisions honor the Lord. And in fact, making good decisions, making the right decisions, make our lives better. You know that that is true. It is always the perfect time to talk about decision-making and making good decisions. Success, success in life and in eternity will always elude you if you fail to make good decisions. And then sticking to those decisions against the influences that are on the outside to the contrary, decisions or forces and, and, and powers that will uh, uh, rally, them, rally themselves against our, for our hurt. Like the time Bear Bryant went to get a haircut on Monday morning after a tough loss on the football, football field the previous Saturday. As the barber was cutting his hair, there was um, kind of an unusual silence until the barber spoke up with some, a little bit of, uh, of hesitation, but also with a little bit of disgust. You, you, you know, coach, I don't think I would have put in that young quarterback just because your starter wasn't doing so well. That young quarterback t- had turnovers that ended up costing us the game. Coach Bryant nodded in agreement and said, well, you know, if I had all of Monday to decide like you, I don't think I would have made the same decision either. Well, the point is, sometimes tough decisions have to be made. And in fact, that's, that's true a lot of times. Tough decisions have to be made. And sometimes tough decisions have to be made on the spot. You don't always get the luxury of second guessing your decisions. You have to make the the best decision you can make, of course, and then live with it and, and, and go on. And of course, correct what needs to be corrected, but you have to make the best decision that you can make. That's the way it is with the business of, of living. We're, we're always being called upon to make decisions. You know, in life, you, you only pass this way once. You only get one chance to start first grade or, or high school. You only get one shot at the first day of your freshman year at college. And so you want to make it, make it a good decision. You only get one chance to make a first impression on a date or in a job interview. And you only get one chance. Listen to me carefully. You only get one chance. Go to heaven only one, 
If you intend to go to heaven, and all of us do, if you intend to go to heaven, you have to make that decision while you're here, while you're living. You only get one chance to walk the narrow road, one chance to answer the call of God, His invitation to you to live a great life. Look at this for just a minute. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God blesses those who endure temptation. God blesses those who, and and he blesses them with his approval. Those who love him, those who make that decision to endure temptation means to stand against it, to withstand it without faltering, without fail. But that doesn't happen by accident. We don't go down that road by accident. And that's just the point. You resist temptation by making the decision to do so. And here's the positive side of that. James chapter 4 in verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What a great statement for us to think about. This statement is important because it makes us aware of what's so wrong with temptation. Temptation is sin's way of meeting its objective, which is to persuade us to do anything else other than submit to the God of heaven. The objective of the devil is to get you to make bad decisions that are contrary to God's will, that are contrary to God's purposes. God, young people, listen to me. God wants you to obey your parents. But you're tempted not to. Maybe you have friends that tell you that that's not important. Or you have the media or or entertainment telling you that that's not important, but I want you to know that God wants you to obey your parents. God wants you to make good grades in school. Oh, now, preacher, you're going to have to show me that in Scripture, okay? Because you won't find a, a, a specific Scripture that says that, but God wants you to do your best. On those, in those endeavors that are good and that are right, according to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. But you're tempted to just get by. You're tempted not to do your best. God wants you to love your husband. He wants you to love your wife. But you're tempted to despise them or to have lust for someone else. God wants you to seek His kingdom first. You remember that? In Matthew 6 and verse 33. But you're tempted to fill your schedule with other things that pertain to this life and that that tend to to, to crowd the kingdom of God out of your life. Good things. Uh, Many of us are involved in a lot of good things, but too many of those things tend to pile up and and we end up crowding out the the kingdom of God. There are a hundred ways, maybe I should say a thousand ways, to make the wrong decisions which makes it so easy, so easy to go down the wrong road, so easy to take the wrong path. But God is calling us to the way of truth and right. And that's that's pretty narrow. Jesus told us that it was narrow in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. That's tough. That's tough. It's tough to do right sometimes. It's tough to go the way of truth. So let me just be perfectly clear. God is calling you to toughness. Okay? God wants you to be tough. Tough in your convictions, tough in your faith, tough in your convictions and, and in your persuasion to, to be what God wants you to be, tough as a disciple and as a Christian, as a believer. God is calling us to toughness just as much as He's calling us to good and right decision making. We should have the time to look at some Bible examples, a lot of Bible examples, because There's so many real life stories of men and women who made poor decisions and and many who made the right decisions. Let's look at just one or two, one or two. Adam and Eve made a poor decision. We can start at the beginning of the Bible. They made a very poor decision. 
They made the decision to listen to the devil. And okay, we may give them a pass because they didn't know who the devil was. And, you know, they'd never been confronted about that. And, but they made a poor decision to listen, not, not so much to listen to, 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 to a creature who was speaking to them, but to listen to a voice that was telling them something contrary to, to what God had, had told them. What did the devil tempt them to do? Well, most people will answer, well, it's pretty obvious. He, he tempted them to eat the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, they, they, they did that. And while that's certainly true, he did tempt them to eat of the forbidden fruit. He was actually, when you dig a little deeper, he was actually tempting them to disbelieve in God. He was actually tempting them to be disobedient to God. And, that made, and then therefore they made the worst decision ever. And the consequences of their poor, sorry choice are still being felt today and they will be felt in eternity itself. Imagine, we don't always know the consequences and the results of our decisions, right or wrong. They made a terrible choice. Terrible choice. There's so many other examples to talk about. Just, just before Joshua, God's appointed leader of Israel, just before he died, he, he said to God's people in one of those great, great speeches or addresses, shall we say, in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14, in that well, well-known statement, Joshua said to Israel, now therefore, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, which has always been kind of a, a puzzling statement to me, but I understand he's, he's employing rhetoric there. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, of course it's not evil to do that. And, 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 and it's not even to be suggested, but, but he's using this rhetoric because he's wanting to show a contrast. Because he wants to strike their ears and he wants them to be thinking in their minds, well, well no, 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 it's not, it's not evil to serve the Lord. Joshua says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, well, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Make a decision. Whether the gods which were your, your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's found again in Joshua 24 and verse 15. Even in his old age, Joshua never stopped challenging others to make the right decision to make good decisions. And then the Bible directs our attention to Moses, who grew up in privilege, you remember, grew up in privilege, didn't start out that way, but, but he, he spent the early years of his childhood in privilege. But when he became an adult, when he became a man, we read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25, that he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So here's a man who, we can look to who, who made the right decision, who made the right choice. When Jesus walked among men and sought to persuade them to believe the gospel and to come into the kingdom of God, their reactions were mixed, you remember. Some made good decisions, some made very poor decisions. One time, you recall in John chapter six that Jesus told a large group of people that they needed to be fully committed to him. And he used very, very uh, uh, language that was unmistakable, unmistakable. He, he challenged them to be fully committed to him. And then the Bible tells us that when they heard that, they were disappointed and they walked away. They made that decision. And then he turned to his disciples. He turned to the 12 and he asked them as they saw the crowds moving away, Will you also go away? Will you also go after them? And Peter made the right decision. I think he was speaking for all the others when he said this in John 6, 68 and 69. Lord, to whom shall we go? You know, sometimes we make the best statements when we ask questions. Lord, 
To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Near the end of his earthly travels, his earthly ministry, Jesus responded to people's rejection of him as, uh, uh, as the son of God. And he responded to them like this. Again, near the end of his ministry in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 and 38, he said to them, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her, her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You, you, you made the wrong choice. You were not willing. See, your house is left until you desolate. So Jesus was telling them that they were going to suffer severely. They willingly chose to reject Jesus and the consequences ended up being quite severe. So we find all of these examples of good decision-making. We find examples of bad, poor decision-making in God's word. It's one of the great things, one of the great reasons why we need to study the Bible is because it shows us these, these examples of, these, of poor decision-making and good decision-making, and we can learn from them. Decisions are the stuff of life, don't you know? All of life is made up of just making good choices or poor choices or good decisions or bad decisions. So take your pick. Take your pick. You've got to take your pick and choose well. Will you serve God or will you serve sin? Whatever you do, choose wisely. This is what I would tell my children and what I did tell my children. Whatever you choose, choose wisely. In the remainder of the, the sermon this morning, I want to give you some reasons why it's important to make good decisions. And you might be thinking, well, I already know I need to make good decisions. You don't have to tell me, but I'm just going to say this by way of reminder because you're going to be presented today and tomorrow and this week and the rest of your life, every day, you're going to be presented with choices, with decisions and dilemmas that have to be addressed. And you need to confront them with confidence and with strength and with God at your back, okay? God with you at your side, maybe I should say. So a couple of reasons why it's important to make good decisions, first of all. And I think that what you'll see couched within these four points that I wanna give you is how to make good decisions. You'll have that question answered as well. First of all, good decisions make you a better person. Good decisions make you a better person. Well, this is reason enough to make good decisions, isn't it? Nothing makes you feel better about yourself. Nothing makes you feel more confident than knowing that you've made the right decision in a challenging situation. Character determines conduct. But the reverse is also true. Conduct determines character. Both conduct and character are determined by the decisions, the choices that we make. Long ago when Cain brought the wrong kind of offering to the Lord, and it was a choice that he made, Cain was discouraged. He was discouraged and he was angry, especially when he saw that his brother's offering was accepted by the Lord. Later, Cain made the decision to take his brother's life. But very important, just before he did that, God challenged him to make a better choice. In Genesis chapter four, verses six and seven, God said to Cain, and if God spoke directly like this to me, I, I think it would get my attention. He said, why are you angry? Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Why are you discouraged? Why are you feeling bad about what's happened? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you choose well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You should make the decision to rule over temptation and over sin. The point is, bad decisions and bad character made Cain into a bitter person. Not a better person, 
a bitter person. We want to be better than that. We want to learn from the example of Cain. God has blessed each of you with enormous potential for good, good for his kingdom, good for yourself, good for your families. Every day comes with new challenges and opportunities to be the best person that you can be before God and before others. And the key to to success is making every decision count for him, for him. And you can do that. You have that potential. Secondly, good decisions win the trust of others. Now that's valuable. That's that's more valuable than gold and diamonds. Good decisions win the trust of others. Trust, trust is a measure of how people think of you, of, of how they respect you. It's an honor to be trusted, not to be taken lightly. It's an honor when others trust you. When people trust you, they value you as a, as a good person. They value you as, you as a friend, as a mentor, as an advisor. There is no greater position that can be achieved in life than to be trusted by the good people around you, to be known as a person of high morals, of, of, of great integrity. But trust has to be earned. Now, when we first meet someone, we usually, I guess we, we, we just do this automatically. Good people do this automatically. They just kind of give people the benefit of the doubt. Right? We give people the benefit of the doubt unless, until they prove themselves otherwise. Overall though, over time, trust has to be earned. And it's earned on the altar of good decision-making. Again and again, the Bible describes the trustworthy person as someone who speaks the truth, as someone who who works hard, and most of all, as someone who loves the Lord, who keeps the first and great commandment. What's more, God will entrust you to do His work and to bring Him glory, and He will use you as His instrument, as His tool in, in affecting others, change in others for good. Far above all others, I want to earn the, the trust of God. We read in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2 that this is how Paul felt. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. God has made all of us stewards. Nothing demonstrates faithfulness like the routine of, of good judgment in the tests and trials of life. Thirdly, good decisions show others the right way to go. The right way to go doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter who you are. I promise you that you have influence over someone else for good or for bad. All of us have some influence. Beanie, I see Beanie back there. She has influence over others, doesn't she? She does. She comes in and hugs me and hugs all of us, doesn't she? All right, that influences me. I don't walk away from a Beanie hug and and think, well, that makes me feel bad. That makes me feel terrible. no. What makes me feel good? How can you not feel good about that? All of us have influence. Every last one of us. Children, oh, they have such... Eliana, she has influence over me, over all of us. All right, Lauren, she has influence. All of these kids around us, they influence us. They make us feel good or bad, but they usually make us feel good. They have such influence in our lives, and that's the way it is. Why, Why would you want to do something wrong? Why would you want to make the wrong choice, knowing that that someone is either going to be disgusted by your behavior and by your words, or they'll laugh at your foolishness, or, or they will follow your example, or at least use your example to justify their own bad behavior? That happens a lot. It happens all the time. But being decisive for God makes you a person of strength, makes you a person of confidence, Others will follow your example. They will. You'll become a person others go to for advice. Maybe you don't want that, but, but that's, that's what happens when you're a person of confidence. That's, that's what happens when you've earned the trust of others. They will come to you for your judgment, for your advice, for your, your opinion. Your example will inspire others, if not to greatness, at least to imitation. Look at, look at our Lord. Look at all the great decisions that He made. Difficult, tough, tough decisions, but He made them and, and we follow in His footsteps. 
You know, Jesus had one goal when he came to this earth to do God's will, his Father's will, no matter what. He said that in John 10, verses 17 and 18. Because of his example, he earned the right to challenge others to follow in his steps. Matthew 16, 24. Even though Paul was imperfect, he was not perfect, but he could still say to others, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. It should be the endeavor of every parent to be able to say to your parents, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. That's the way we want to live our lives. That's, that, that reflects on the decisions that we need to be making. Fourthly, and last of all, last of all, good decisions ensure a brighter future both here and and in eternity. Good decisions ensure a brighter future in our lives right here and in eternity. When good decisions are made in your life, one after the other, you you start showing a routine in your life. That's important for others to see. They become building blocks to a great life. Good decisions, one after the other. A series of good decisions will create a series of positive results and rewards. Just as the wise men, remember, who who built his house on on the rock, which was Jesus' word, not to be missed. Jesus' word, Matthew 7 and verse 24. Don't just think, well, I'm going to build my life on the rock. No, know what that rock is. It's the words of Christ, the teaching of Jesus When you build your life on the rock of Jesus' teaching, Matthew 7 and verse 24, then you will be, as defined by God, a wise person. A wise person. Faithful decision-making results, shall we say, to carry the metaphor a little further, a rock-solid life. A rock-solid life. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the life God blesses and rewards. This is it, what we're talking about. What is faithfulness but making the right decisions over and over and over again? There's no limit to the positive things that are going to come into your life. And I stress no limit because here's what the Lord has said in Revelation 22, verse 12 through 14. He's in charge of the consequences of making good decisions. He's in charge of the rewards that are going to come. I, when I think of God being the one in charge of those rewards, I think, wow, isn't heaven going to be worth it all? Isn't heaven going to be amazing? Better, better than I can imagine. Jesus said, and behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments. The meaning there is who make that choice, who make that decision to do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Jesus knew that his father was always with him because as he said, in John chapter eight and verse 29, I always do those things that please him. I love that about Jesus. It's perfect, it's perfect. I always do those things that please him. Can we say that? I always do those things that please God. How did Jesus do that? How? By making the right decisions by making good decisions. You know, in in Luke chapter two, at the end of that chapter where Jesus' life as a young man is being described, he he grew in stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus must have started making good decisions early on. The earlier you start, the better it's going to be. All right, let's close out. Every time, every time we meet together, We offer an invitation. Um, I'm up here and we have an invitation song and and, and Jerry's going to lead us in that song and one of the elders usually comes up and stands up here with me or I'm with them and we extend this invitation and don't misinterpret what's happening here. It's not our invitation. It's the Lord's invitation, okay? 
It is his invitation. And what is he inviting us to do? He's inviting us to do this, just a couple of verses. Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me. He's he's inviting you to make a decision. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's his invitation to you and me. And that's a decision that has to be made. It's a good decision. Listen to me carefully and then we'll be through. I want you to know God loves you and he intends to bless you. He intends to give you a great life. But there's one condition. You need to make the right decisions in life. You need to make choices that reflect faith and confidence in Him who's already decided to save you and bless your life if you will meet this condition of coming after Christ and following Him. The best decision you can make is to seek the Lord in His will and follow Him in everything you do. As Isaiah said in Isaiah 55 verse 6, seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Come now, as together we stand and sing our invitation hymn. <clears throat> for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me, how Jesus. 
I'm going to be reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. It's a passage not usually associated with the Lord's Supper. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. To those of us who are being saved is the power of God. It's humbling to speak of and remember the only death that alters and affects every man. Without the cross of Christ, mankind would have no hope. To me, it's staggering how those Christians, how those people in Corinth who considered the message of the cross, the death of Christ, foolishness. Some thought it was foolish that Jesus did not prevent his death. They thought, how could one put trust in someone that could not stop what was happening to him? Of course, we know that Jesus could stop his death. We know that God so loved us that he allowed the death of his son for us on that cross because we needed a savior. We needed the shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins. We know that it was not foolishness, but the love of God. It is because of this sacrifice made by Jesus that we as Christians meet around this table weekly to remember and partake of the emblems the unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine that represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 through 25, Paul so clearly wrote through inspiration the words of Jesus when he instituted the Lord's Supper on the night that he was betrayed. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now let us focus our minds on that sacrifice as we remember this morning the sacrifice and death of Jesus for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for this time that we have this morning to come around this table and to remember your son's sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to take this bread, which represents your son's body that was put on the cross for our sins. Lord, help us always to reflect on the magnitude of that sacrifice and what it means to us and the life that we have through it. Lord, just help us now take this bread in the manner that pleases you. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
God in prayer. Father, our God in heaven, we continue this Lord's Supper. Father, at this time as we partake of this cup, which is symbolic of the blood that he shed on the cross. There's life in this blood. Father, that we know that we have the hope of heaven thanks to the sacrifice that Jesus made in shedding his blood there. Father, we pray that as we partake of this, we do it in a manner that would be, be worthy to know, Father, that we're as Christians and how we're to do this uh, every first day of the week. Let us do it, Father, faithfully. And, Father, to realize the importance of it when we do take it. Father, we bring all these things to your Son. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is the taking up of an offering, an offering that we are to give as we're prospered. I'm going to ask uh, Jared, he'll give thanks for the collection. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity that you've allowed us to gather as a family and to offer our worship to you. We ask that. This morning, we are humbled by the blessings that you give us. We ask that you help us now at this time to give back, not grudgingly, but with a willing and open heart, knowing that this is our way of uh, giving back to you all the blessings that you've richly given to us. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
like to extend another welcome to our visitors and glad to see everybody out this this morning. I know we have several that are out sick, some that are traveling, so keep them in your prayers. And uh, we have a lot of things going on in this congregation that need prayer, so be mindful of that this week as you're going about your daily lives. Don't forget to take time out for, for God and for prayer. You'd be standing, with this, be dismissed with mansions over the hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land. pray our father in heaven we're so thankful this morning for the many blessings that you have blessed us with we're especially thankful for this opportunity to come here and to be able to worship with you worship with our fellow Christ brothers and sisters in christ we're so thankful for brian and your lesson that uh, you delivered this morning to us we pray dear lord as we leave here today that you uh that you'll go with us, Lord, when we can make better decisions each and every day that will bring us closer to you. We were so we want to, again, pray for those that are sick and afflicted and for those, the many that uh, have struggled in the decisions that they have to make in each and every day. Pray for those that uh, have lost loved ones and the ones that's on our prayer list. We're all we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.